This is 40K Today. 40K News so important, your tank commander just issued orders to subscribe. Welcome to 40K Today. This is your daily 15-minute news, views, and interviews show that covers the whole hobby of Warhammer 40,000. I am your intrepid host, Paul Murphy, and today is June 19th, 2020. I just made a Star Trek reference on a 40K show. What do you think about that? We have a poll each week where we want to know what you think. This week we asked, whose buggy do you like the best? The revealed Space Marine Invader ATV or the underappreciated and underutilized Achilles Ridge Runner? Let's get to the results of this week's poll. For the past week, we've been running a poll on our Facebook and Twitter pages asking which buggy does it best. By a whopping 44% margin at the time of recording, the Achilles Ridge Runner takes the case. Come on, folks, give this Primaris ATV a chance. We're going to jump right into our first feature segment with Mark and Eric from Lorehammer. If you aren't familiar with their show, you really need to do yourself a favor and check them out. Them and I sit down for a few minutes. Hold tight while we queue it up. Yeah. This is Paul for 40K Today, and I'm joined tonight by the guys from Lorehammer, Eric and Mark. Hey, Paul. How's it going, buddy? Hey, Paul. Thanks for having us on. Yo, thanks for joining me. For folks that may not be aware of you, you guys do a podcast and all kind of other stuff. Got Discord and stuff. Tell me about what you have going on. Uh, yeah, so we started off doing a podcast because I was running out of friends to talk to 40K about. So I said, what better way than to just make a podcast and talk to as many people as we can. So <laughs> yeah, we've been doing Lorehammer for three years now, and it's we've talked to hundreds, maybe thousand people by now. So it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, a lot of different ways that we interact with people too, whether, uh, yeah, it's on our Discord or uh, we chat with people on our Facebook or we do daily lore posts on Instagram which is pretty cool. We just have uh, pictures of really awesome 40K artwork and then little snippets of lore to try and get conversations rolling about what it is. So that's yeah, really cool. Those are probably one of my favorite things that we do. Yeah, it's just, it's very easily digestible, which a lot of 40K content is not. <laughs> well, it's a big universe, man. Just because, yeah, exactly. So <laughs> our, yeah, our Instagram page, we do like, yeah, that quick little snippet of lore, so. <laughs> That's on the Lorehammer, Lorehammer Instagram page. So what do you guys, I mean, if people can't guess, what do y'all talk about on your podcast? <laughs> well, we focus specifically on in-story uh, universe or in-universe stories, sorry, yeah. uh, specifically talking about how the universe um, kind of functions and kind of the underlying rules that exist within it and how all these different races act and react within it. So it, it's a pretty broad thing, but we avoid talking about the gameplay itself and we really focus on the story. Yeah. And another big portion we do too is we we help or try to help people come up with their own story and how they can work their lore into existing lore without it being, you, you know, know, just a little, crazy. Yeah. Try, try and keep things as, as realistic in a fictional universe as possible. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a tough one, but yeah. 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 That's pretty cool. Do you have a, yeah. a favorite time period? Like both of you, do you have into, like, what's, what's your favorite time period within the 40K like scope of stories? Oh, boy. Um, I think for me, I really liked uh, the Age of Apostasy and just the whole like uh, how the Ecclesiarchy was founded because it's such a big portion of 40K. And absolutely it's yeah. just so untapped like the whole george van dyer heresy and, type thing and yeah yeah and like thor sebastian thor yeah is yeah, yeah. yeah like the hero of the imperium yeah, yeah. It, it, it's just such a huge part that has shaped 40k drastically like it's all this whole religious ceremony and stuff and that all comes from that time frame yeah, that that's a very cool one uh it's really tough for me. Part of me absolutely loves uh, old Ned Necron story of the war in heaven and the stories even before they were um, Necron and they had just been flesh and blood with old ones. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm hesitant to to try and focus on that because I, I just I want the stories to be set in 40K, but I love that old timey information and the origin of it. Well, Everyone Traveling loves an origin story. In the warp, you know, between the two areas of the galaxy, you know, imagine the galaxy is a sphere and they've traveled between this the sphere. I don't know. It's, it's, really, it's really captivating. I'm with you. And the Age of Apostasy, you're, you're, you're dead on. I've actually, one of my Adepticon team themes was based around that and the marine chapters or whatever. And it's so cool. It's like when, um, when what's his name? They, he decided to blow up a bunch of uh, Black Templar citadels. 
Okay. Oh, what? Uh, and that, yeah, I think I, I think don't, it's one I, of the things that unfortunately set off I can't help you. The age of apostasy is when oh God, what's his name? What's the uh, the, the chancellor's Doge, name? Doge, it's Doge Van Dyer. Yeah, that <laughs> is it Van Dyer? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I believe so. I think that yeah, you're using yeah. Like, there's just so much untapped potential. Yeah. So yeah, I mean that's uh, I mean that wasn't even in our in in the the pre Indominus Crusade time period. That wasn't even that long ago in mm-hmm. uh, like space marine lore. You know, regular, I guess, just lore, 40k lore. Yeah, absolutely. Like it's like for for the long lifespan of Space Marines, and for the like the fact that they're so steeped in this to have it happen only you know five thousand years ago is is not that long for them. So, do you guys think there's plenty, yeah. still plenty of stories to tell in between, like ten minutes after the heresy and where we are now? Oh, <laughs> oh yes, you it, can pick apart any one of those uh, ages that they have yeah. that all have these cool little snippets of lore that I would love to see expanded. A- absolutely, I think there's infinite possibilities, really, in in a galaxy where almost you can find anything and any iteration of humanity that you ever wanted on this on on these planets. So, uh, it's it's one of the coolest settings because it's created a very open-ended place for storytelling. Uh, with the storytelling in mind, do you have any wish list or predictions of how, how the story is going to advance? And how cool is it that we get to talk about the story advancing? We've been playing this game for I'm gonna thirty something years or whatever. <laughs> and the story yeah. is like it, it's always been you know five five minutes to midnight, but here we are. We're we're moving that clock. What are your predictions? Oh man, that's. That's tough. I'm notoriously bad for making predictions, so uh... <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. Oh, they could be wrong. Um, yeah, I don't know. So I'm starting to lean more and more that I don't think they're going to be bringing any more loyalist primarchs out. I think we we have ninth edition being released, and there's no hint of a loyalist primarch. Hmm. I don't know. Yeah, it, it seems like that would be the perfect time to do it. We might just be stuck with Gilliman now. Well, stuck is a strong word. Ah, uh, cursed. <laughs> <laughs> So we did a series a little while ago on the Black Crusades with Abaddon, the Despoiler, and I kind of learned a lot about the real horror that is Chaos Space Marines, and that is the Black Legion. Um, and so after seeing the culmination of the 13th Black Crusade, I'm really wanting another solid Black Crusade. Like, I, I just enjoy reading about all the times that he uh, came and was doing his assaults, and I got, like, a new respect for him. I, I mean, he's memed pretty hard into uselessness. Um, <laughs> when it's not the case. Yeah, when when he's, like, one of the craziest creatures out there. And so I'm really excited for them to incorporate a Black Crusade into the whole Imperium versus Necron uh, setting that they're kind of orchestrating for Ninth. Yeah, over over time, I think I feel you were or Abaddon. He, he's almost become like a caricature, uh, you know, a cartoon of himself. But when you've got some of just those, just the stout people writing for him now, he's mm-hmm. basically a indomitable force of nature. And it's, I'd love to see. So I agree with you. I think that would be great, a great thing to see. Yeah, because he got his whole new model a uh, year ago or whatever, and we really didn't get much about him. Yeah, we got Vigilus out of him, and then that was kind of it. So I'm yeah. really hoping they've got something on the back burner that they're going to splash in my face, and it's going to shock me again. So <laughs> You know what we lost? What's that? What? Kadia. No! No, not Kadia. <laughs> uh, well, guys, thank you all for joining me. Uh, I, w- I want to catch up with you all again soon. Hopefully we can do that. Yeah, for sure. Man. That Thanks sounds awesome, us. Paul. Thank you so much. Have a good night. You too. Bye. Thanks a lot for joining us. It was a treat to have them on. Today's episode of 40K Today is brought to you by Frontline Gaming. Frontline Gaming is a one-stop shop for all your Warhammer hobby needs, discounted products, American-made gaming mats and terrain, and a full line of miniatures painting service and daily hobby content. And this can all be found at FrontlineGaming.org. Welcome back. Adam Camilleri is one of the best 40K commentators on the planet. Let's crack open his hood and get some thoughts on Warhammer 40K 9th Edition. My good friend from the Art of War Down Under, Adam Canamalari, and I think I pronounced that right, but you correct me if I did it wrong, Adam. That's what uh, I meant. Yeah, welcome to the show. We're going to talk about what you guys, so obviously, this new 40K thing has kind of turned into a big deal. What is going on in Australia? What does that meta, how, how is the response there? And then what are the plans for uh, Art of War Down Under? So, yeah, thanks for having me on, man. I really my ple- absolute pleasure to be here. Big fan of what you guys do. Um, f- first cap of the rank, ninth edition in Australia. I think it's going to be a big deal. 
Like, I think it's going to be quite a big deal. Where um, I'm in, currently, I was part of, set to be part of the 20 to 2020 uh, WT team. W, sorry. Dude, <laughs> WTC team, right? The World Team yeah. Championship team. Yeah, the World Team. Yeah. yeah, for the team for Australia. And I'm not quite sure whether they're going to be transitioning over that to the 2021 team. And I believe we are. But I'm in, I'm chatting with those guys, and everybody in there just seems to be super hyped about ninth edition. Was it, there's a little bit of concern? I think we all had a bit of concern, and when the edition was first announced, thinking it was going to be another layer of complexity stripped back. But that I think that's kind of. Uh, went the wrong way. I think it's gone the opposite way. I think there's been a lot of depth added now. The more the more we see developing about what's being released, like the, the new, new terrain rules firstly, add a, a new whole new depth of complexity to the game that I'm really excited to explore. And although people seem to be concerned about the, the limiting of the table size or, or whatnot, or what seems to be adopted wholesale already by the majority of um, you know the upper echelons of competitive 40k, I, think, I don't think it's going to be as big a deal as people think. I think I had a bit of doom and gloom about it when it first came out as well, thinking, oh, it's just going to favor aggressive armies or it's just going to favor a certain style and it's going to be very polarizing. But um. I do have very high hopes for this edition, and I think it, it could be everything that ninth is, and, sorry, eight was, and more. I mean, that's that's a good place to start, right? We can all agree, eighth edition was one of the best editions of forty k in the history of the game. Now, there's some people that might say, "Oh, you know, this was better or that was better," but it's it's in the discussion anyway. And so it's a, and they're not changing a lot. They're just adding, like you said, additional terrain rules, tweaking a few things. The table size is getting smaller, but I think as a basis for the game, like. If you liked eighth, you're probably going to like ninth. It's a lot of the same game, in my opinion. Well, exactly right. I think um, with the the mass popularity of ninth of eighth edition, it'd be it'd be a, almost a, a massive mistake by G Dub to diverge too you know too far away from what they know is a successful edition. Uh, you know, wholesale off a of, essentially will be maybe a whim, but. Um, Look, I, I think, and this is, this is I, I'm known for my broad sweeping statements, but I think it's almost safe to say that the reason this edition was so successful was because of how closely linked G-Dub was to it. It was a living rule set that changed with the flow of the competitive scene and with the way people enjoyed playing the game. Now, I think if that, had been applied, if that mentality had been applied to any of Games Workshop's editions, we would have the successful game we have now. I think it's only through their you know, ongoing intervention in maintaining the enjoyable rule set that we had such a successful edition. Actually, I, that's that's an interesting topic. Let's talk about that for a second because we, we hadn't decided to talk about that. But I want to point out that the work of the Falcon actually is a big part of why oh, we dude. had such a good edition because he had data to back up our feelings, which is mm. this is too good. This isn't good enough. And GW, one thing that we learned is they do respect the data because when they looked at the data, they made changes based on what the data told them. And a lot of people don't know this, but Peter was in the background writing to these guys, talking mm -hmm. to these guys, saying, this is what we're seeing. And a lot of their responses weren't necessarily directed by the Falcon, but I, I assume that the data that he was providing was giving them context and helping them come to their own conclusions, right? Yeah, I guess finally for the first time we could say a two-way street was opened with G-Dub where they accepted the feedback of the player base just as much as we had to accept, I guess, the rule sets that they put upon us. Um, and, you know, we, for the longest time, I think we, the player base, have conformed and adjusted where necessary what G-Dub's produced in order to make it fit what we want the game to be. Um, but yes, like I said, for the first time, it's a two-way street now. I think that's been all the difference. I think it, it would. I don't, I'm not necessarily. I don't necessarily think it wouldn't would have mattered how good the actual like 40k rulebook for this edition was. But as long as I had, we had that two way street between the community and the organization, I think we're always going to have some success. Yeah, and then I mean, they have some stone cold killers on the playtest team now. Oh, like, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And some guys, have... with, guys with legit legitimate clout and like longevity in the game. They've been they, these are guys who can look back and say, "This is how the game's been for the last like twelve years that I've been playing, twenty years I've been playing," and say, "You know, this is where I think it needs to go." Blah blah blah. So that's that's a huge boon, massive boon. Okay. Uh, so last question before we go. Um, you obviously, you're plugged into the Australian scene. How excited are you guys for the new mission sets that are going to be coming out? Like, have you guys talked about that at all? Uh, yes and no. Well, we're of the opinion that we've been playing 
we we play a lot of we played a lot of ITC. We didn't play Nova missions. We played a lot of ITC, a lot of WTC down here. Um, I think we're all a little bit happy that the WTC missions might be going to the straight rule book rather than the amalgamation, and because they used to be Eternal War and Maelstrom, and then Kill Points, and then the tertiaries like First Blood Warlord, Linebreaker. All of that combined into one big mixing pot of a mission, and it could, it got quite overwhelming. But it was also like a really big like uh, I guess. A uh, point of competitiveness that you could be, a, you could master such a complex and deep mission set. But at the same time, it was overwhelming to try and make a make a a, a group of armies that would function cohesively in those mission structures. And not some of them have like good mashups now, but oh, but the mission is terrible for me, so it's not a good matchup anymore. That that kind of stuff. It added a huge amount of complexity to the game that I didn't think was necessary. So I'm really happy that we're going to this more. Uh, Sorry, for the first time, I think, for the first time in the world, maybe, we have one streamlined mission set for the whole world. That That's what I'm excited about. Stupendously exciting. Um, yeah, and the data, the data we'll be able to get from that about how people like to play, want to play, um, that'll be exponential as well. Sorry, go. No, I was just going to say, speaking as a content producer, right, we'll be able to do comparisons across geographies, which will be really fun. So, it, so I, that's what I'm looking forward to. That was Adam Camilleri, folks. My man, the people's man. What are you doing, Jolene? Before we say goodbye, it's time for the model of the day. It's the, the model of the day, the, the model of the day, the, the model of the day. Be still my heart, Hobby Hammer TV shows us some astounding Blood Angel Terminators. Yeah, yeah, I will find a way to work Blood Angels into every show. Hobby Hammer TV makes these plastic kits sing to the bell chimes of thunder hammers. They combine deep reds with contrasting colors on the bases that really draw your eyes into these tragic heroes. As always, if you have a model that you want us to feature on the show, or you've seen a model we should feature on the show, let us know by using the 40K Today hashtag on Instagram. Use that hashtag 40K Today with the number two. And that's it for today. Thanks for joining us. A big thanks to our content producer, Alex Banner, our social media whiz, Tanya Gates, and our technical producer, Seamus Ronan, for all the hard work and once again, putting this program together. Tomorrow, don't forget to tune in for our best of the week. Download it via your favorite aggregator. Please like, share, subscribe, leave us a five-star review. That's what keeps us going. We'll see you tomorrow. Keep tuning in. We're just getting started. But for now, that's what's happening in 40K today.